Good morning, church. I'm Gary Nur, Groves Pastor, and welcome to worship. Deacon Marilyn is preaching today, and she will be preaching on the topic of how our witness can lead to the transformation of others with whom we're in a relationship. Let's take this time to quietly prepare our souls for work. Our first day is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 65. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and inhabit another. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on my holy mountain, says the Lord. The word of the Lord for us. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson this morning is taken from Luke 21, verses 5 through 19. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, he said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and plagues. And there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated.
Well, how was that for a cheery gospel lesson? <laughs> Jesus is telling us in this passage from Luke that we'll be facing wars and insurrections. There will be natural disasters like earthquakes, famine, and plague. Uh, we'll be imprisoned, and our family and friends will betray us. Isn't that all something to look forward to? I have to say that this particular passage is a really good example of Jesus being able to relate to the world we find ourselves in. Because we're there, aren't we? We certainly have wars, and not just the war in Ukraine. There's conflicts all over the place. Earthquakes, famine, and plague. Now we're dealing with those. Not to mention wildfires, drought, massive storm damage with flooding and loss of life and property. How many of us know someone who at some point has been arrested and imprisoned? It's actually a pretty common thing in the United States. And how many of us have been betrayed by a friend or family member at some point? I mean, just consider the divisiveness that's in our society right now. Jesus is telling us that these terrible things are going to happen before the end of the world. And so sometimes people look around and say, well, obviously the world is coming to an end right now, right? Uh, but it's not really correct. So if you look at verse 9, Jesus says the end will not immediately follow these events. And how many people have come forward to proclaim that they know when the world is going to end? Remember Harold Camping and the Family Radio Network several years ago? I think that year he was saying October 21st was going to be the end of the world. And, you know, it wasn't. Uh, and it would have been amusing if not for the people that bought into that and then suffered in the aftermath. Jesus tells us in Mark 13, verse 32, but about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. So it seems like idle speculation isn't really going to be that much help to us here. All we can really do is live as best as we can in the world that we have. And we should note that all these terrible occurrences are not unique to our time in history, right? Can you name a generation that has not encountered bad stuff? Wars and natural disasters seem to be kind of inherent with living on our planet. So this is the world we have. We can just live in that world as best we can. So how do we live in this world as followers of Jesus? Well, one thing we can remember is that we have something that the rest of the world may not have. We have a deep joy and hope in our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells us in this gospel lesson that our role in the midst of all this is to stand up right in the middle of everything that's going on and testify to the wondrous love that God has for each and every one of us. And in response to that love, how we can live like Jesus, love others, heal the world, and bring about pieces of God's kingdom. This testifying, this witnessing to our faith, is really important. We see it time and again in scriptures. I had a seminary professor who had a favorite verse that he used to share with us. It's from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. People are going to see that we have something that they don't. And they may ask us about that. And we need to be able to share with them our experience in God and Jesus. The United Methodist Church believes witness is important because as we join a congregation, that's one of the things we promise to do. And if you remember two weeks ago, during the baptism of Noah and Evan Lewis, part of the service was we all recommitted ourselves to support the church 
with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. You got it. So witnessing is our witness. You got it. So witnessing is important. But how do you feel about this idea of witnessing? I think some of us may be a little queasy at times because this image comes up in our minds, maybe, of someone who very aggressively is going after someone and insisting that they have to believe in God and Jesus right then or else. And you know, that may be your idea of witnessing, and that may work for you. But I have to say today that that isn't necessarily how it has to go down. Okay? If we go back to this verse about witnessing and how important that is, and then keep reading, it says, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. What concepts, gentleness and reverence in our world today? Ooh. Um, so we may not need to beat someone over the head with a Bible. We may not need to tell someone they're terrible people if they don't immediately believe the same as we do. And we may not even need to go running out of the sanctuary after the service is over to pounce on the first person we see walking down Boot Road and to shout at them saying, God loves you. Now, you know, that person might in fact appreciate hearing that, but it might also be seen, depending on the individual, as kind of a scary encounter. You know, it would not be our intent, I would hope. Anyway. So how do we witness? I believe that God gives each of us specific opportunities, openings, where our gentle and reverent witness may be welcome. We just need to ask God for the ability to recognize those openings when they occur. And then we need to listen to God as we are being advised to say something and then go ahead and speak, being willing to share our experience of God and Jesus at that time. And we don't even need to prepare a script for this in advance. Okay, We don't need to whip out a piece of paper and read it. Because our gospel lesson today tells us that we'll be given the words we need at that time. We just need to share authentically of our experience of God and Jesus. One place we can start is to not be ashamed or embarrassed by our identity as Christians. Despite bad PR that sometimes people calling themselves Christians generate in, you know, on the news or in our society at large. One thing we can do is share with our friends and colleagues at work, perhaps, occasionally, what we're doing with our life at Grove, what ministries we're involved in to help the community, or what programs we're going to, or what events that are interesting and helpful are happening. We don't need to read a, you know, a huge list of stuff every day, right? But once in a while to just kind of drop in a piece of information like that. And by doing that, those people are going to know that reasonable people like you all can be Christians. Okay? And having known that then, if they have questions, they're more likely to feel like they can come to you and ask a question, which gives you an opening to share with these people when they, when they want you to share. You can do that. When I was working at the USDA, uh, at the time, I was involved in the Thresholds Mentoring Program. And so some days, I would leave work and just casually mention to someone that 
well, my activity for this evening is I'm going to go to prison. And that would generate some interesting discussions. Okay. My technician at the time was from Mongolia and she felt comfortable asking me questions that she had. I remember one day she asked me about the Jehovah's Witnesses that she'd run into. And I do remember another occasion where we were sitting at the lab bench having a wonderful conversation about Christianity while we were busy filling sample vials for the liquid chromatograph tandem mass spectrometer to analyze. <laughs> so, you know, these opportunities happen. And witnessing doesn't always require a conversation. Our actions can provide a witness if people know that we are Christian. Uh, a famous quote attributed to St. Francis of Assisi that you may have heard is preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Sometimes just showing up can be a powerful witness. How many of us have appreciated people coming to a funeral of one of our loved ones to support us, but also to witness to the shared power of the resurrection that we believe in. Our actions can be important. Two weeks ago, I was at our local urgent care facility after having cleverly missed a step and damaged an ankle. And I was being checked in by this very nice woman who was asking a number of questions, one of which was, what is your occupation? So I said, well, I'm a deacon in the United Methodist Church. And then I realized that's an awful lot to type in. So I said, you know, a clergy person. And she looked up at me and said, oh, well, that explains why you're being so calm about all this. <laughs> and I thought to myself, huh, did I just provide a witness to God's peace here? So, you know, why is witnessing important? Aside from the fact that we're told we're supposed to do this. It's important because when we provide a witness, good things can happen. We can bring about a piece of God's kingdom on this earth. Which brings us to the Old Testament lesson that Pastor Lynn read for us a little while ago in Isaiah, where it's describing the transformation of the earth to a new world. Did you hear that glorious description of God's kingdom on earth? Oh my goodness. There will be no weeping or distress. Everyone will live long lives. There's going to be adequate food and housing for everybody. There's economic justice and there's peace. And, and then there's that beautiful image of the wolf and the lamb eating together that brings back a recollection of the peaceable kingdom earlier in Isaiah. Really beautiful. But you know, we see that. Consider the healing that can happen when we come alongside to provide comfort to someone who's experiencing a difficult time and offer to pray with them. Consider the witness provided by Christians working through the Good Works Program or Project Restoration to ensure that people have houses that they can live in safely or those who advocate for low-income housing, which is seriously needed. And then there's that image of the wolf and the lamb eating together, where, where the lamb is not the main force, okay? Such things can happen when Christians witness to God's love for everyone. I'm reminded of uh, last month's Redemption Project video that the Bro Prison Ministry book group was watching. And in that video, a woman is meeting with the man who killed her mother when she was just a child. 
And that meeting provides some healing. And after that meeting, the two of them are able to go out and share their story with others. The wolf and the lamb. Or consider the Courageous Conversations program that our conference is running right now, where Christians having very different ideas about a particular topic come together to learn from each other and care for each other despite their differences of opinion. And I'm sure that's just a couple of examples. You could come up with lots more, right? The world sorely needs us as Christians to witness to the love God has for all of us. And so today, I'm going to leave us with two questions to think about this week. One is, how is God calling each of us as individuals to witness to God's love? And the second is, how is God calling us as Grove Church to witness to God's love in this world? Bear in mind, God may suggest something that's similar to what we've been doing, or there may be something new and different that we're hearing. My hope and prayer is that we will each be able to prayerfully listen to God for God's call on our lives to witness, and then may be able to move out in faith using both our words and our actions to witness to the world and transform that world. Amen. And we extend the peace of Christ and wave as well. The peace of Christ be with all of you. Share that peace with one another. to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to join me in our congregational open road prayer. God, may your preferred will break through, change history, usher in and accomplish through us your new hopes, dreams, and possibilities, both in the life of our church and in our own lives. We surrender our wills for yours in order to fully follow you. Amen. May the power of God's love be in your hearts and reflected in your lives now and forever. Go in peace and may God's peace be with you. Amen. Now let us go out from here, listening for and following God's call on our lives to witness to God's love so that our world may be transformed. Amen. Amen.